When we deal with the specific constants of the universe, whether in physics and cosmology or whether in chemistry, these are very specific numbers that define relationships. Mm. And virtually every law has a constant in it to equate yeah. the two sides of the equation. Yeah. And that's determined experimentally. Yes. D do you put the same level of, uh, of, of commentary significance on the constant as on the law itself? How do you, do you differentiate them? Well, you can state some laws without invoking any constants, I suppose. Um, after all, the law of conservation of energy does not depend upon right. constants. But um, Newton's laws of motion depends upon the value of the mass of, of something. Um, uh, no, I, th I think, um, on the whole, laws are frameworks for encapsulating the behavior of matter, that when you want to make um, numerical predictions from. So, so I, I think what I'm saying is that a law enables you to comprehend the behavior of matter, and but you need the fundamental constants in order to compare y your law and the comprehension it provides with observation and to know whether it is an accurate law or not. So the constants then are embedded in many laws, some of the laws, not necessarily The constants all of them. enable you to make contact with reality. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And sometimes the constants are in conflict in mm -hmm. a sort of way. I suppose going back to you know, the fine tuning of the universe, then it, it, that there's a balance between the different values of the fundamental constants, which leads to a benign universe for us. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that a law is fundamentally a, a framework of comprehension. Uh, and then the, the fundamental constants are a way of mapping that comprehension onto the reality that you experience. Uh, that, that's very nice. Now, to state the obvious, that same law seems to apply at all locations that yeah. we know, that yes. there's no difference in these laws and constants here across as the far world as we can see, and, and back across in the time. universe and, and back, back in time, time because yeah. we're able to look at those yeah. laws back in time yeah. through cosmological observation. Yeah. Yeah. So it's both a time machine and a distance yeah. machine. Of course, we don't know that in the very you know, first f fractions of seconds of the universe, which we can't yet observe, whether something funny was going on then. And we certainly don't know what's going to happen in the long-term distant future. But the, the nature of law uh, is, is, is an assumption that people make, but it's so fundamental to how we deal yeah. with reality. Yes, I think you should distinguish the, the law from the theory that underpins the law. So the law is a summary of observation, and um, it's quite conceivable that the, the observations change with time. Um, I can't think of an example of that at the moment, but um, okay, so sort of entropy might come back down again rather than just going up. Right. Um, but the theory that underpins it should be able to cope with the evolution of the law because you know, the, the, the theory might predict that the law, the observations, will change hmm. over time. Well, what, what's an example of how a theory articulates with a law um, uh, being uh, uh, under, uh, more fundamental? So the law... Yes. Let, well, let's use... Um, well, all, 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 all sorts of things. I suppose the, the propagation of light okay. um, is, is one example. You know, the, the, the law is it travels in straight lines, put crudely. Mm. The underlying theory is the wave theory of light, Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, effectively. Now, at the moment, this, this um, underlying mathematical structure doesn't in the least predict any evolution of the behavior of light, but it's certainly conceivable that you could dream up for a more complex theoretical substructure, which led to the speed of light gradually changing, something like that. 
And that would be a fundamental difference in how we perceive yes. the universe if, if light would evolve in yeah. one way or another over huge amounts of time. Yeah. Yes. But that is, again, part of the scientific yes. uh, system. Yes. And one of the extraordinary things about science is that its, its mind is open to all this kind of amazing conjecture. Mm. But at the same time, uh, scientists don't rush in where <laughs> um, conjecture fears to dread or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> that it's, the science is not just imagination. It's imagination constrained by observation. And we should do both as vigorously as possible. You bet. Absolutely. We should be totally free to make up yeah. as many strange ideas in science, yeah. but then test every one of them as rigorously as yes. possible against observation. Yes. And the more imaginative, the greater the rigidity oh. of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of Confirming them. That, that, that's a very good point. And the higher yeah. the the higher the uh, the bar that you have yeah. to jump over, yeah, uh, the the more yeah. the more outlandish. Yeah. In effect. and the more it differs, yeah. the more it differs. Yeah, uh, and and when relativity, Einstein's relativity, differed so significantly in its fundamental structure, yeah. a high bar was required. Yeah, but you could also see that it was it emerged from classical physics and helped to explain some the conundrums in in classical physics. Right, right. Um, so it wasn't just Einstein waking up one morning and proposing a theory of relativity and so on. Mm. It, he was driven to it by observation and, and reflection upon the current theories of the time. You know, that's an interesting distinction because we have today among first-rate cosmologists a series of very aggressively creative ideas mm. about... Uh, uh, multiple universes about uh, budding off of mm. new universes and black mm. holes and and uh, multiple dimensions. I mean, there's a, a cascade of very original and exciting yeah. potential ideas, which everybody admits there's almost no direct evidence for, although there may be some mathematical yeah. expressions of. Yes. I mean, it could be that science is entering a very delicate phase mm. where um, its ability to test itself against yeah. it by experiment is beginning to cost too much when you need a linear accelerator the size of the solar system <laughs> to test the latest idea. Right. You, you, you begin to wonder whether you'll actually be able to raise the funds for it. No. <laughs> but I think even those theories which are untestable directly in that sense will have consequences that even on a laboratory scale, you might be able to predict, to, uh, to, to verify. Like, you know, it could be that although you need really a universe size accelerator to test string theory, you might find that it also predicts the, the charge of the electron perfectly. Sure. Which is good secondary evidence that you're there. Or extra dimensions. Uh, they're Indeed. looking at, it's, it's impossible to have any communication, yeah. but now the thing maybe gravity, because yeah. of its extreme weakness, represents some sort of yeah. a leakage between one and another. And so there may be some specific predictions Indeed. that can be looked at. And if we're infanticizing um, mode, then you know, the long-term future of the universe is not simply the evolution of the fundamental constants, but all these little curled-up dimensions could slowly uncurl so in the you know, long-term future, the universe might have a completely different dimensionality from the one that we're currently inhabiting. I mean, that gives science such, such an excitement, such, a, such an extraordinary mm. vision that really is uh, um, un unheralded. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's, uh, sort of, science is a monument to the human intellect.